Welcome to That Season Air podcast. I'm your host Gina. Stick with me as I chat to season airs, expats and adventurers across the world sharing their inspiring stories and interesting insights into living and working abroad. Today we take a trip down memory lane with author of the Anti-Blueprint Project, John Weaver. John takes us back to his first experiences working on ski seasons in France and Austria and how he took the quickest and cheapest route through university, allowing him to rapidly pursue his passions. In this episode, John explains how staying productive and stepping out of the crowd brought him the opportunities that paved the way for a successful career working for big brands such as Burton and ultimately landing his dream job working for Nike in the US. Stay tuned as John runs through his experience in teaching his kids to snowboard and shares his wisdom on setting goals, pushing yourself forward and following ambitions, encouraging you to step out of the blueprint and create the future you've always dreamed of. Here's the show. John Weaver, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Wonderful to finally meet you after several (laughs) conversations backwards and forwards and trying to get this arranged because you're a very busy man. Sorry about that. No, not at all. Thank you very much for making the time. Tell us a bit about you. Where are you from in the UK and what do you do? So I'm from Maidstone in Kent, so about an hour southeast of London. Mm -hmm. I was brought up there, spent a bunch of time in Wales growing up, and what I do now, Mm -hmm. just to go end to end... So I recently left Nike. I was with Nike for 10 years and then I'm working in a freelance capacity now for a few different brands. Oh, so it is pronounced Nike, not Nike. It's funny because, yeah, <laughs> when you turn up on campus, you're like, oh yeah, I want some Nike Air Max. They look sick. And people are like, it's a uh, Nike. <laughs> it's funny because you even like, you have sales meetings and you have people from the UK come for sales meetings and they'll present and they'll be like, oh yeah, these sick Nike Air Max. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and the Americans are just like, what are you talking about? Well, it's good to have that finally cleared up. Thanks. There you go. Um, so, you, do you consider yourself an expat or a seasonaire? Like, obviously, I think you're past the seasonaire status at this I, point. I think so I'm past the seasonaire <laughs> status. The expat thing makes me cringe a little bit because I, I don't know, I suppose in my head when I think of expat, I think of people who've they're 60 years old and they've given up on oh they've whatever sold their business and they've decided that they're going to go and live in the Costa del Sol right and so they got their feet up by the pool yeah probably got a copy of the sun they're enjoying their life it's great so and I suppose I think of myself a little bit less like that and I suppose I think of myself as trying to be wherever we go a little bit more integrated into the local community and also also when you think about it the Mm -hmm. fact that we have borders that require passports to leave and move around Mm -hmm. is kind of dumb like I get it yeah but there's a large part where I'm just like everyone's not sure your background history etc but I mean everyone roughly comes from the same place at some point down the line so it just seems strange and then so I suppose that's why I cringe a bit with the expat thing I prefer I suppose I try to just be a little bit more um of a person of the world I suppose nomadic yeah. Is that the right word? Even that inspires visions of van life people. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Even that, I'm like, I don't know if I'm that. I'm not sure. Yeah. I don't know. I don't do very, yeah. I suppose I'm lucky that me and my wife are happy to uh, live in multiple places. Yeah. And we kind of just get on with it wherever we are. Like, like it's funny because living in the US, there's some people that every weekend they want to go and hang out with other people from the UK. Right. And like eat bacon sandwiches and hp sauce and all that <laughs> and it's nice once in a while but yeah. i'm like why the hell the like point? why are we living five thousand miles from home exactly to be hanging out with people that we could hang out with from london like yeah. it just doesn't make sense to me yeah. and, sorry because um, no, i know, no, I, know no. You're, I know you're no, no 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 not at all i like i totally agree i think yeah you should try and integrate yourself into the life a bit get to know yeah. the locals of the area and the more people you meet the yeah. more variety that comes into your life so yeah yeah um so tell us about how you got into working and living abroad in the first place yeah when I was young I was very lucky that my parents especially my mother was always like very she was always trying to get us to try new things so we tried things like sailing I remember one summer climbing obviously football stuff like this and then I started skiing at the local dry slope I think I was like 11 or 12 okay and that was something that really just appealed to me I really enjoyed it so I skied for a few years. I had to take a couple of years off, kind of like when you hit puberty and then your knees, just, for me, my knees just seemed to hurt constantly for two years. Ah, okay. 
and growing. Then, growing pains, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then when I got to 16, I started again. And then at 17, went on a school trip. Um, and on that school trip, I tried snowboarding on the last day. Right. And as soon as I tried it, like had hard boots and all the rest of it, as soon as I tried it, I was just... Something went off in my brain. I was like, well, that's what I need to do with my life for the next foreseeable future. And I remember I only did like two or three runs and like fell the whole time. Mm -hmm. Got back on the bus, going back to the the hotel. And I'd met like a couple of the people who worked in the chalet or the hotel where we were staying. And I was just like, well, I think that's what I should probably do with myself. And even on the bus, I remember telling my teacher, like, I'm going to go and do a season next year. I'm not going to university. And that was all within like an hour. Um, so you were pretty young when you realised that the UK wasn't perhaps for you. Yeah, I don't know. I suppose I've always felt a little... I suppose I always struggled a little bit with like, oh, it's Friday night, it's going to get wasted, down Maidstone. Mm. It just... It's something I'm sure, you know, we did, but I just always struggled with a little bit. I was kind of like, yeah. well, is this going to Lakeside to the cinema on a Friday night? Kind of, is this what... Is this as far as this is life this goes? Yeah. I don't think so. So yeah. trying snowboarding... It just kind of set in motion the wheels where I was like, okay, I think that's kind of how I want to spend my next couple of years. Yeah. And, and how did you get into that? So basically, I was at, so I was in sixth form and we were in the f- final year of sixth form. Got back and I, by this point I told my teachers. We were the first group through sixth form doing a new GMVQ thing and the teacher kind of hadn't got us up to speed. So we were essentially staring down the barrel of like doing a third year at college or you know a-level times Mm -hmm. so I was like right I'm not doing this so I bought a discman I bought the two-pack album me uh all eyes on me and I just listened to that thing on repeat for like six months and I worked and I finished the course in time and so most of the people I studied with went back for a third year so as soon as it got to summer I started working to earn money and then that summer I applied for work with first choice holidays Mm -hmm. um so you go down to I think it was Brighton they have like a jobs fair right you go down to the jobs fair and it's like, okay, we've got, um, you know, these are all the places we have, these are the jobs we have, and you kind of look at the jobs board and it's everything from hotel manager, assistant manager, chef, sous chef, chalet, chalet maid, girly. I apologize for calling it that because this was 20 <laughs> years ago. I'm sure now yeah. it's like chalet operative yeah, or something. something. Like that, yeah. So you could be chalet operative. It also sounds quite cool, that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Or, you know, barman, et cetera. And so, of course, I was like, yeah. right, I'm going to apply to be a barman because I know I can do that. Yeah. And then, so you do that and they tell you two things, right? Don't apply for being a barman because you won't get the job and don't apply to work in Val because you won't get Val uh, Who told you that? The people at First Choice because okay. it's kind of like everyone wants to work in a bar and everyone wants to work yeah. in Val Because it was at the time kind of, you know, if you're like, do it, if you're going down that route, it's mm-hmm. kind of the one that everyone wants to do. So anyway... A couple of weeks later, I get the letter back and I'd got a job. That was great. And then you kind of wait and you're like, where am I going to go? Da, da, da. Yeah. And then I can't remember if it was like when you're on the bus or if you're, when just before you leave, they send you the letter and it's like, oh, you're going to work at La Forêt as the barman in Val d'Isere. And you're just like, oh, this is happening. <laughs> yeah. Insane. Yeah. Cool. So then they pick you up at Dover, um, mm-hmm. Dover or London. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, like these people you never met. And I also find it ironic because basically like, you know, the hotel we worked at, it was like, I think it held like maybe a hundred people. Yeah. And you have, you have probably like, I don't know, 15 to 20, 18 year olds with literally zero clue about anything, <laughs> myself included. And they're like, okay, you're in charge of this hotel now. And he's, okay, great. Off okay, we go. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then the kind of chaos ensued for the next, for the season. And so that was when I was 18, which was uh, a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> So did you enjoy it? Yeah, I mean, it was, I think it was everything I dreamed it could be, you know, from getting to go snowboarding every day. Mm-hmm. We got paid, but like, man, I think it was, I think it was like 50 pounds a week, maybe yeah. like 200 or maybe even less than 200 a month. But you had accommodation, which was basically a room probably this size with four guys living in it. So like <laughs> a bed in each corner. But, you know, at the age of 18, you're like, wow, like, look at this. We've got our own, like, single hob kitchen. Wow, we're really living. So then snowboarding was amazing. You got to meet, like, all these people from all around the world, which is amazing. And then, yeah, you're just basically in charge of this hotel. And still to this day, I'll always remember those first couple of weeks when guests come in and you're just like, wow, like, we're being paid to look after these people. Yeah. And it's just, yeah, it's a crazy, crazy feeling. And it's such a nice way into doing a season because you... You get to see, you know, you get to experience everything. Yeah. 
but you still have like someone who's not chaperoning you, but like you can't just not show up for three days like you have a job to do yeah. um mine was pretty structure there yeah the bit of structure mine was pretty great because i didn't start work till four every day nice so i worked from four till one which was amazing because then yeah obviously you can just ride all day long yeah didn't have to wake up um perfect yeah it was pretty That's pretty cool. epic. yeah so i did two winters in val d'isere and midway through the second one i was just kind of like okay this is the most fun it can ever be but like I have this thing in my head where I suppose I, I suppose I worry a little bit that my, like my brain was going bad or something. I was like, am I getting stupid here? So I was like, I need to do something to keep myself moving forward. So I decided to go to university, did the uni thing, but I, and I kept snowboarding throughout university, Mm -hmm. except for the final year. I didn't, I kind of said to myself, right, I'm not going to bother going on snow this year. I'm just going to ride dry slope, which was fun. Okay, so were you in the UK? Yeah, so I went to Southampton right. Institute, which was the cheapest and the easiest to get into. Right. And it was great. We had like a really fun dry slope there, like 40 meters long. It was tiny. And so we'd go there every Wednesday night. But through university, like th- that was the other funny thing I found about university. You study and you have like, what, 11 hours a week? Yeah. Which is ridiculous because... I I was just always thinking we could probably achieve this whole course in a year. Yeah. So I kind of got a semi full time job on the side to earn money, and then the first season I went back to Val d'Isere for. I know I went long enough to buy a season pass, so I kind of went for like two months, I think, in the first mm-hmm. year of uni. Second year I came to Meyerhofen with a couple of friends, Josh Wolf and Henry Jackson was here, and a couple of other people, mm-hmm. and that was. I feel like that was the year they moved from the shilling to the euro, which tells you how, old, how well <laughs> long ago it is. It actually sounds so ancient. And um, yeah, so then the next year I didn't do a season. And then that next year after leaving university, I was like, right, I can go and do a season now. What should we do? And I'd been to my half and I really enjoyed it. I met my best friend, Tom West. Mm-hmm. And we were both kind of like, okay, we think that's where we should probably go. It was cheap very cheap at the time and so we kind of thought yeah we we know they've got a park we know there's some backcountry let's try Austria let's try my off just going back to you being at uni what were Mm -hmm. you studying there I studied international business okay and why did you choose that so I went originally and I did a I actually applied for like I don't know computer science or something Mm -hmm. so I'd probably be way richer smarter etc than I am right now if I'd have done that (laughs) but I don't know you know sometimes you you I know, you know, you pick up a magazine, you're like, oh, this magazine is not really for me. Like just the whole vibe. Bit. I was, I suppose I'm not a very detail oriented person. Mm-hmm. And I know that from the outset on most things and computer programming, etc. I was just thinking like, this is going to be a bad, bad situation for me to yeah. get into. Right. <laughs> and I suppose I've always thought of myself a little bit more of as a, as a generalist rather than a specialist mm-hmm. on any subject. So then international business was something where I could learn about all the facets that make up business from finance marketing sales etc mm-hmm. it was also the shortest course of three years and it also meant you could travel for six months of the course so i went to finland for six months as well so wow. in the end i only had to be in university in england for two and a half years okay so it was the cheapest the quickest and yeah it was a great experience met a bunch of good people there yeah and how was it studying in finland um, it was really good. I would advise it to everyone like yeah. to, to, to study abroad because, well, with this whole Brexit chaos, they actually took away the Erasmus program now, which is a real shame. Mm-hmm. But it was on the Erasmus program where you would go somewhere. The I feel like the accommodation was subsidized. You still had to pay your fees in the UK, but it was still very affordable. Right. And then when you went when you went there, it was all taught in English. It was pretty amazing because it was to a town called Uvascula, which is where uh, Nokia are from. And so basically... Over the, like across the other side of town, Nokia were there. And at the time, Nokia were the biggest cell phone provider in the world. Mm-hmm. And so you got to like learn all these case studies about that, which was like super interesting. Cool. We had an American, half American, half English teacher. So the whole thing was great. And in the end, you basically just had to pass and show up. It right. wasn't like you weren't moving any great mountains. Going back to Meyerhofen, what were you doing for work? In my- were you working when you were in Meyerhofen? Yeah, the first season we came to Meyerhofen, Tom and I both got jobs working at Brookenstadl, oh, which yeah. was the, uh, I, what's the nightclub there? Or maybe that's what it's called, I forget. Yeah, it's called Brookenstadl. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Right. Yeah. It's been a while. Well, <laughs> I couldn't remember it the best of times being there. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. so Brookenstadl, like to the left, there's that, um, there's a hotel there. And we got jobs as waiters. Right. And 
Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Like, yeah, we would go there and we were just waiters. And so we'd go in every day at like five, we'd get food, which was obviously a big help. So you just go in there, throw the food out, clean the food up, off you go. And it was yeah. great because it was like four hours a day, you got food, got some money. And so you, it meant that we were kind of able to come out the back of the season without like spending all the money, I think. Yeah. So. You were writing for White Lines, were you, at that point, or was that later? So I was trying to figure out exactly. It's funny now because with, with cell phones now, you're able to kind of provide a diary of your last decade, yeah. like back to 2007, basically. And everything from 2007 back from there, I'm <laughs> no like, idea. I think it was Could this year. Yeah. So I think it was the first year. Yeah, I think it was the first year I came to do a season or potentially the second. But I got a job working at White Lines, Snowboard mm-hmm. Magazine. Um, they had a feature in there which was focused on dry slope and they wanted to improve the quality of the content, make it more substantial. And so I spoke to Matt Barr, who runs another podcast, Looking Sideways, which you should check out. Mm -hmm. And he was the editor and he said like, okay, this is what we want. Roughly, I think it was three to 4,000 words a month based on the dry slope scene and him and the rest of the team working on it. You know, they're all doing seasons in these amazing places. And so having to do like dry slope content it felt probably like a bit of a laborious task for them. Mm-hmm. So I was I was like more than happy to do it. So I started working for them and um, I would were I think my deadline started, I believe it was May or June 1st and then went all the way through to December. So like 4,000 words a month. And so December rolled around and I would be able to go off and travel again, mm-hmm. which was great. Uh, it was funny as well because I remember the first one I did like I wrote, so I got a A in English language and English literature, but I suppose I never thought of myself much as a writer, but I got mm. those grades and I did the first 3,000 words and I sent it in to him. And I didn't really know him at the time. I kind of knew of him and I was, suppose I was a little bit in awe. And I sent it in and then I got this email back with just like so many corrections. And, you know, when you're at school and you get the red pen from the teacher, it was mm-hmm. as if the whole thing had just been... <laughs> obliterated by red pen i was like oh, i just don't think this is going to be the thing for um. me yeah but then <laughs> thankfully he was and i suppose i've taken this a lot with me since then like he's one of those people who was super honest yeah. in the beginning so you kind of know like okay this is the standard we have to reach yeah from here i have to up my game and then so i suppose i've always appreciated whilst it's harsh in the beginning people who are very honest and upfront exactly so. what was the idea in coming to Meyerhofen. So, yeah, so the the thought of coming here was just they had a really good park in the winter. The winter that I'd visited, there was like the generation, I suppose, before me. So Chris Carr and some of like the the pros at the time had been here. And I was always sort of impressed. You'd see content from here and you'd see the park and you were like, oh, that looks like an amazing place to go. Because they would always have the park up and running fairly early, which at the time, like seeing Penkin this year where the park was ready like Christmas Day or something Mm -hmm. despite the pandemic was amazing you know back then I think the park would be ready like first couple of weeks of January which in Val d'Azur at the time like the park was something that happened maybe in March like it was always an afterthought Mm -hmm. and so we were like right we want to go somewhere where we can ride park early and often where it's not too expensive and there's some powder um And yeah, those factors all kind of played Mm. into why we came here. So you had your job at the Brook. Yeah. Then where did you go from there? Great question. (laughs) So the next season, we lived down in Ramsau and we lived above what is now like a kebab shop on the left-hand side as you come into Ramsau. Mm -hmm. Um, And I believe we didn't save... Man, or maybe that was the... (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Or maybe that was... Okay, there's there's a two-year period... One year we lived above the kebab shop. One year we lived above uh, the candle shop. I can't remember which one came first. Okay. The candle shop was basically, again, a room this size with a, which was the lounge and the kitchen. And then there was a door, which was essentially a storage um, cupboard. And we put four mattresses in there and we all did a season in there. And that was like 15 euros a week or something. It was ridiculous. Ah. So each. So super cheap. So we... (laughs) Did the second season, I think it was the second season there, and then the next season we went to the other place above the kebab shop. Um, those two seasons I didn't work through because I was like working full time in summer because Austria was fairly cheap, and then because of working for White Lines, I was kind of okay mm-hmm. financially, so I could make it work without having to work through the season, which was really nice. And then the third season we were here, I started. I started doing some work with. So I was writing for Forum at the time, which was run, had just been purchased by Burton. Right. 
so I did like a couple of things like helping them at ISPO and stuff down in Munich. I think I did two ISPOs working for them. Like, so you'd go to ISPO, you would clean the booth, you would hang the clothes, you would basically work for four or five days before ISPO. And for anyone who doesn't know, ISPO is a trade show for um, winter sports down in Munich in the first week of February. Mm -hmm. So it's when the whole industry comes out. So we would set it up for, say, three or four days. Probably some of the hardest days work I've ever done. Yeah. You know, you'd be on the stand from like <laughs> seven in the morning till 10 at night, just cleaning and da da da. Did that. And I think I did that for like two years. And then the second year, the um, person who was running for him at the time, she was like, oh, we might need some help doing some events. We might need some help doing, um, putting together a team. So would you be keen on helping? So kind of didn't really know it was going to lead. But yeah, I, so I signed up to become an intern. I think I was like, I think I did 10 months as an intern. I was like their longest serving intern there, I think. Really? So I did three what I'll call seasons, since this is the season air podcast. I did three <laughs> three seasons here in Meyerhofen. Right. So the first season we came to Meyerhofen, we stayed in Gastov Silatal. Right. I remember it was always notoriously different, difficult to find any accommodation. And we mm. asked around everywhere. And we asked at the bakery next to uh, Beckner's mum's restaurant, yes, Ibhata. Yeah. She said, oh, you should try Gastov Silatal. Went down there, we got a room, and it was amazing. Like, we were in the top... The top right hand side as you are coming out the door, apartment, we had plenty of space, it was phenomenal. And then um next year we were down in Ramsau and the year after we were in Ramsau. So one year was the kebab shop, one year was the candle shop. The next season, Henry Jackson and I were looking for a place to live. And uh Sylvia, who was yeah, Sylvia Hunsbich, who's from Schwendau, she said, like, Oh, I've heard about a house coming up to rent pretty amazing like three story house with a basement and a garden and that's what went on to become the hunger pain hotel right. so we took we rented that i believe it was like year 2005 or 2006 okay when we went in there there was no light there was just like cables hanging out the walls for the light fixtures <laughs> um it was insane and we got it early we got i think it, we got it in like november or something i'd been here because i was interning for burton over the summer right so we found this house and we're like, amazing, great. So we called all, everyone, like all the boys. All of a sudden we had like a nine bed house full with people. Wow. Rent was, <laughs> rent at that time was 1200 before you paid for the gas and stuff. Okay. Um, so it was like, again, it was super cost effective to live there. And we had everyone in this house, which was probably the most fun ever. I yeah. was, I was working slash interning at the time as well though. So it yeah. was great fun, but after a while it kind of got a little old. So I lived there for a couple of years or a year or two. It was amazing. And then work kind of went from being an internship three days a week to becoming a full-time job five days a week with a lot of travel. Mm -hmm. The house continued to be fun, very fun, but the two kind of didn't mix after a certain point. So in like 2007, I moved out of the house and got a place in Schwendau on my own, um, with my girlfriend at the time, Marika, who's mm -hmm. now my wife. And um, yeah, so we moved over there. And it was great because Hunger Pain Hotel was an amazing time, an amazing experience. But I always remember there was one night when, so James Thorne used to live with us, who was, he was British champion maybe at the time. Like he was really, really good. I remember like one night it was like 4 a.m. and he comes in and everyone's like partying downstairs and there's music going on. And so I'm like, I go down, I'm like, right, what's going on? I've got work in the morning. I've got work in like three hours. What's going on? And he's like, oh, what's up? What, you don't you don't like drum and bass? Do you want us to change the music? I'm like, I don't want you to change the fucking music. I want to turn it off. <laughs> yeah. So, but that was kind of the, the straw about the camel's back. I was like, I think. I, and again, it's nothing about the house or the people. I was just no. like, hey, I'm just at a different point. Yeah, exactly. At, at this point. So I need to move on. So um, yeah, moved over to Schwendau and then lived there for like, actually lived there for five years. Mm -hmm. And so I worked at Burton until 2010. So did five years which now when I drive to Innsbruck, I'm like, how did we do this commute every day? Yeah. Five days a week. But we did it and it's totally fine. And that's actually how I learned German. So ah, like okay. my wife was working as well down there. She got a job um, a year or so after I did. And then we kind of, that's kind of a little bit how we went from just friends and onwards. Um, nothing sketchy happened in the car, but basically <laughs> we would drive together. And then, you know, I kind of learned German just from talking with her. And oh, I had right. a notebook and so I would ask her like all different kind of sayings and stuff in German. Mm -hmm. And then um, in the office, they would speak German as well. Is that where you met? 
Me and my wife met on Queen's Day in Amsterdam in, I'm going to say 2005. And we just kind of met each other at a nightclub, Paradiso. Gangstar were playing. Uh, Rolly was there, I think. Huh. Who's going to be one of your future guests? I think Rolly was there, yeah. <laughs> um, and then I met her and her twin sister on New Year's Eve in Scotland Yard. Obviously, like, you know, staying in touch with people wasn't a thing at this point. So then all yeah. of a sudden she shows up in Scotland Yard I was nervous as hell and I was like, oh dear, okay, there's that girl. Well, I'm not going to talk to her because I'm way too shy. And then at the end of the night, she's like, why are you not talking to me here? What's wrong with you? I was like, <laughs> her German accent isn't that bad. Um, it was just, yeah, it was pretty funny. So then we got talking and then through the next few months, we kind of got to know each other. Then she started working at Burton and then um, it kind of went from there. Awesome. God, I hope now she doesn't. I hope she doesn't get rid of anybody. She's probably like, "This is a terrible <laughs> recollection of how our love started." <laughs> um. So yeah, now you've got two kids and married. So that's now we got two kids and married. Awesome yeah. Story. Yeah. And and currently in Meyerhofen. Exactly. Teaching them to snowboard. Yeah. Very cool. Sense. What advice would you give to anyone who's thinking about doing a season? Yeah, I would just say make sure you like enjoy it for everything that it is. Mm-hmm. And I know I'm guilty of this, of overthinking stuff. But just make sure you come back with it with, like, having learned something. It might just be a new skill set. It might be a new friend group. But just just see what else you can do along the way. The reason yeah. I say that is you have those opportunities where you can go and learn new things, understand new cultures, etc. And if you come back and you're like, well, I, le- I learned to do another 180. I can now do a 540. You're like... I don't really know if that's kind of long term. Yeah. Cool. What else? And I would just say, don't get in tons of debt doing it. Yeah. I saw tons of people doing that in my first season, just getting credit cards and rinsing them, and right. then ended up kind of crippled financially. So don't get in debt. Like go and get a job. There's plenty of jobs wherever yeah. you go. It is a good idea to find something that you can make a bit of extra cash out of. Yeah. Like you did the white lines, yeah. for example, and you did some commentating as well, didn't you? At Aaron Star, is that right? Yeah, so me and Henry, who um, I lived with back in the day, Henry Jackson, we did. We were kind of on similar paths. I was host. I would host various snowboard events. He did some as well. Then we started working together, and we had like a little company called Banterbox, mm-hmm. and we did events for Volcom. We did European Open, US Open for Burton. Then we did. Um, I did Aaron Style in Innsbruck, mm-hmm. like the live on snow thing down in Bergiesel, which was amazing. When I moved to the US, though, I kind of was like, right, I can't do all of these things. So I gave that one up and gave him the work I had from that. So then he's gone on and he's done amazingly. He's ended up doing like Olympics wow. and basically every event there is, he's done it. And he's been full time with that as his primary income. It's easy 10 years now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's awesome. carved himself quite the niche. That's so cool. So tell us a bit about where those seasons and then the work at Burton led you career wise after that. So I, as I say, so I worked for five years at Burton. Mm -hmm. I was always in the marketing department. So events, team management, and basically everything else in between, working with magazines, um, print titles, etc. And then 2010, Nike had been, Nike were in and around snowboarding. Right. And they wanted to get in a little bit more. And so a friend from the UK, Phil Young, who does all kinds of skate events and stuff, he hit me up like, oh, can we have a chat at ISPO? So I like went over to the Nike booth at ISPO whilst working on the forum booth. I was like, hey, da, da, da. met the GM for Europe. And she was like, oh, we'd love to really get into snowboarding in Europe. And we think you could be the person to help us do it. So, wow, yeah, exactly. So I was kind of like, oh, okay, that sounds pretty good. And um, <laughs> they wanted someone to do a freelance team management role. Right. And at the time, so that meant going from full-time employed in Austria. Mm-hmm to like contract to working for yourself essentially working for nike you know my parents were like well why would you walk away from a very mm. you know there was a bit of that of like yeah that does seem sketchy to it's go from secure. that yeah but then on the other hand i said to my parents i was like there's a nike probably only come once in your life knock, yeah. knocking on your door mm-hmm. you have to kind of take it when it's there so i took that and then so i ran the european team for two years so put together like signed all the athletes we wanted kind of became the face that all the magazines would go to if they needed something in Europe. And I did it all from Meyerhofen. So it was wow. that was the amazing thing. They didn't need me to go to Amsterdam. I went like three times. Yeah. But then when we would get new product drops and stuff, I remember one day Tom called me and 
because we live next door to each other now. And he, they, they must have brought like, I don't know, 50 or 60 boxes of outerwear. So not just shoe boxes, big boxes. <laughs> and so he'd built like a tunnel into my front door because there was that much product. <laughs> um, but so I kind of did it all from there. And then, yeah, after a couple of years, they said, oh, we want someone to do this for us globally. Um, would you be prepared to move to the US? So then I'd always wanted to work in the US. So wow. then that's when I kind of took that jump. Yeah. yeah. How was it, it was, working in the US? It was amazing. It was, um, I suppose I had this thought with me and I have this thought with me all the time, <laughs> I suppose. But like <laughs> you go to your first meeting and I was just thinking that they're, they're going to find out soon. They're going to realize <laughs> that I'm not the person they're looking Imposter for. Imposter syndrome. Yeah, basically, because you go into these meetings, like people are, and also it's different in the US, like people are, people are talking in a very different way to we did in Austria. And they I was just thinking, this is, this is going to like, it's essentially that they're going to find out sooner or later that I'm not really up to the job. <laughs> so then you kind of like, you think, right, if I can do three months here, that will be on my resume that I can do three months. Then you know, six months. And then you're like, if I can do a year working at Nike in Beaverton, it's on my resume that I've done it. And then, then when they find out in a year, I'll be totally fine. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, a year went to two years and then I stopped doing purely just team and I did like all marketing for them. We brought out a film, we went through the Olympic cycle. Oh, wow. Yeah. And the, to go through an Olympic cy- cycle at a company like Nike is pretty insane because it's, it's a sport moment kind of unlike any other because you you know especially here in austria like downhill skiing or in the u.s with nbc who have the deal like it's on all the time people know olympians they're very much part of the furniture and so we had i believe we walked away with that with like four medals from that olympics including sage winning the gold medal and yeah it's just an amazing amazing thing to be part of wow and how long were you at nike for i was there 10 years so i did yeah (laughs) i know one year you were that was the goal (laughs) <laughs> 10 years later so I did there. my one year goal um so I ended up doing four years on snowboarding then yeah one day they were like right snowboarding business doesn't make sense for us financially we're going to pull out right they spoke to me about working on skateboarding which I just felt like I would be a little bit of a fraud on because I don't really know it that well and of all the of all the action sports industries I feel like skate's the one you need to have your shit together you can't just wing it so then I moved over to actually got a like a yeah, I covered for someone who was on maternity leave and that was on um, training. So like CrossFit and stuff like that. So I worked right. on CrossFit for a couple of years. Then I went over to work on the women's business. Struggled immensely at the beginning because I was just, well, it's just kind of, it was at the, so 2016, 17, it was like everyone was in this, you need influencers, you need this. And I was, I, I'm like, geez, I just come from working on CrossFit and then working on snowboarding. I don't really know that world and I always felt uncomfortable. So then I just looked for two things that I was like, okay, I can own this. Mm-hmm. And so I focused on sports bras and tights and leggings because I could see the, like, if you're going to do sport, you need a sports bra. And leggings are just such a big business. Yeah. I just thought like those are two business units I can kind of own. And so I kind of, yeah, I became the, the sports bra guy at Nike, ironically, <laughs> for a couple of years there. Um <laughs> And I could tell you everything about how the sports bras fit to the competitors, to the margins and everything. That was yeah. kind of how I spent my time. Wow. And then at the very end, just before I left, I worked on uh, football, which was kind of always my dream to work on football. And it was amazing. I, but wow. I started March 9th, I said three days in the office, and then we had to work from home. Right. Okay. And that was the last time I was on campus. Yeah. And then Corona happened. And then Corona happened. And I left in uh, November. Okay. So what was your COVID-19 experience? The whole thing started, as I say, new job, three days in the office, then went to work from home. I remember saying to a friend, I was like, are you ready to work from home? She's like, no, they'll never send us home. I was like, I think they will. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, um, but honestly, Nike were phenomenal through the whole process. Like yeah. the first few months, it was, we would have like family lunch where you could, you know, do DoorDash or um, Uber Eats and you could order whatever food you want for you and your family. And we'd all have like family dinners like over oh, Zoom, cool. which was amazing. So we did that for a few months. But then we got to the point where we also we bought a house in Portugal as well mm-hmm. before, on a like completely separate train of thought. And then the US was kind of just in a bit of a difficult period. Going into June, the numbers spiked like crazy in the US. And I feel like Europe 
did a hard lockdown, did well from it. And then towards summer, I felt like Europe were under control and the US was going out of control. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about banning US residents, which we were. So we thought, right, if they're going to lock the borders on July 1st, we need to leave. We came to Europe um, June 28th right, okay. and we went to Portugal. So then we went there, worked from home. So I worked, basically I worked nights for like four or five months so i would work from four until midnight or one or two because wow. of the time difference yeah mm -hmm. and we made it work and like everyone at nike was so good about it and they totally understood why we were doing it yeah but yeah long term it just wasn't really feasible to continue working that way mm -hmm. and we also kind of realized i think through corona i think a lot of us realized i know for us as a family it made me realize that how much i value like community and having people around who you can trust and call on and you know we have that in portugal we have a very tight-knit group of friends and we have mm -hmm. it here you know there's like tom as i say is our next door neighbor and is phenomenal with the kids um yeah. he'll take the kids at a moment's notice and that's something that i feel we didn't really have that in the u.s right yeah i tried to come december 1st to go to innsbruck to meet the printer from the book and then uh, so the night before i was like well i'll just do a corona test just to you know be a good citizen and of course that came back positive oh really i i've got no i think i had it in march already oh, okay but I tested negative and then I tested positive in December with zero symptoms. My wife tested negative, my kids tested negative. So right, okay. very strange. Anyway, that meant yeah. we couldn't then travel 14 days. We're back on quarantine. Right. So then we flew over here December 17th with the goal of staying through January like 30th. And then with various travel restrictions and stuff. And also it just worked for us to be here. It's been yeah. really, really good. So um, yeah. It's funny because it's always been one of my goals to do a proper, to do a season with my kids, I suppose. Yeah. And this was, I suppose, the realization of one of those goals because we're, what are we at, like February 20th now, something like that, you know, and you think like, okay, that's two months. That's, it's not a full season, but it's not too bad at all. So, exactly. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. You mentioned there the book. Mm -hmm. When did you get the idea to start writing the book? Yeah. It's called The Anti-Blueprint Project. We have a copy of it just in front of us here, thanks to Mr. Tom West. Uh -huh, okay. So tell me a little bit about when you got the idea for that. So there was a few different things that went into it. The first thing was I wrote a blog probably four years ago after my mother passed away and then we had kids, it kind of, you know, you kind of get into reflective moods at certain points in your life. So I wrote a blog about what I would tell my 14 year old self. Right. And I put it up on online and I had a few people kind of comment and get back to me. And then through the start of Corona I, and the lockdowns, I started writing some more blogs and I just, again, I suppose I just remember I really enjoyed it. And I republished that one and then I put it on LinkedIn. And when it went on LinkedIn, that's kind of when I just had people I knew were saying I would tell myself this and then it just got shared and shared and shared. And at the end I had a thread with like, I don't know, 200, 300 people who were like, I wow. would tell myself X and Y. And so it just got me thinking that there was definitely, there was definitely something to it. I didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. So I called a couple of friends, called one guy who runs a podcast, someone else who has a book and kind of was talking to them like, I think I've got this idea. And then I was thinking as well, like, well, I have enough people who I know who've done very interesting things with their lives who either didn't study or did study, but studied something completely different yeah. or changed career course halfway through. And so it just got me thinking. So I essentially asked a few people their advice. And then one person who I did a season here with back in the day, Nick, mm -hmm. we lived above the candle shop together and the kebab shop. Um, <laughs> he, he's he gone on to become like a food writer. Um, oh. He's done stuff for The Guardian and I called him and I was like, right, I've got this idea. I don't know what it is, but these are the people that I know. I think mm -hmm. there's something to it. And he's always very honest up front and was just a bit like, well, you kind of need to think about this a little bit more critically. How are you going to go after it? I then put my thoughts together. And then essentially I just started setting up Zoom calls with people. Um, and I just focused on the conversation would go multiple different ways, but it would always come back to what you would tell your teenage self. Yeah. And that's essentially how I started and wrote a book mm -hmm. without really thinking too much about it just kind of started just yeah. got going so I so then I started having these zoom calls and then I remember I sent an email to Sani Alababich who designed it for me and I sent him an email I think that was last week of June as well just like hey I've been working on this thing I don't really know what it is yet but I probably need your help on it so the whole thing was done just like let's let's just start working and so 
by the time we got to June, I essentially had, or July, I had like 100,000 words on my computer, roughly with some kind of shape to it. And then Nick obviously edited the book. He was able to then help me put it into a little bit more thematically designed. And then Sani was help, able to help it turn from black and white words on a page mm -hmm. into a book and a visual center, etc. Yeah, so I interview people, as I say, who've got interesting paths. So a few examples. Orlando Eisnerdell, he used mm -hmm. to do seasons in Meyerhofen. Um, great snowboarder, great friend of mine. We traveled, made films together for a while. Wow. Um, he, he's actually one of the few people I know who's done the Penk and Roof Gap. So you climb up on top of Penk, uh, sorry, Hallberg Lift Station. Right. And ride off into that little field of trees underneath. So there's like a pretty decent gap next time you go up Hallberg, check it out. So mm -hmm. Orlando did that. After making snowboard films, he then went on to make some travel films. And then he ended up making um, a film about Skatistan, the, um, like skateboarding in Afghanistan for women. He then went on to make other films and he ended up winning the first Oscar for Netflix for his film Varonga. Wow. And then he went on to make White Helmets, which I believe also won an Oscar. And he was probably one of the best examples where I was like, well, he didn't even study film. He studied anthropology, so the study right. of people. And that just put him on a path where he was just intrigued by what makes people tick, essentially. So he's one. Then I spoke to a guy I met via LinkedIn, Clinton. He is now a graphic designer and photographer. And at the age of 33, he was working in like a paint factory, like spray painting cars, and realized that that's not what we wanted to do. Just had a child. So basically, he would wake up every day at 5 a.m. He would do Photoshop for, say, two hours in the morning, teaching himself Photoshop for two hours. Mm -hmm. Then go to his job in a paint studio, come home, play with his kid, do all the stuff you have to do as a dad. And then at nine o'clock, he would then get back on Photoshop or go out and take photos at night. And so it's just people like that who I found very inspiring, where I thought other people would like draw the same takeaways as me. Mm -hmm. You've written a lot of insights in the book, different sections about mm -hmm. goals and mm -hmm. money and self-care mm -hmm. and travel. Who is that aimed at? The whole book was aimed at teenagers. Okay. But um, I have to say, you know, we've been running ads and stuff on Instagram and Facebook and things like this, but it's very hard to actually engage with teenagers, primarily because um, they're all on different platforms now. <laughs> like, yes. you know, they're on TikTok and stuff like this. Um, and, you know, they're not, those platforms aren't built for monetization yet. So it's not as easy to direct target uh, content mm -hmm. to them. So, the content was originally aimed at teenagers, but it has felt that throughout all the feedback I've had, I've had a lot of people who are like, oh, I'm 30 and I just quit my job at a Fortune 100 company. Like all different people have reached out and have found it insightful. The The one thing I'll say with that, with those chapters in between, I tried to write those because I think we spoke before we started the podcast. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things that I think we all think about, but we're maybe not open and happy enough to say to other people so for yeah. example goal setting that's probably one of the chapters that most people reached out to me about because and maybe it's a thing because we're from the uk i don't know mm -hmm. but if you have like an audacious goal and you're like i want to do xyz i know me and my friends group sometimes people were like yeah no you won't do that yeah. and my goal with that was like hey like it's totally fine to be like that like most people who achieve anything have at some point put their head above the parapet and said i want to do this and so on the back of that i've actually run four goals workshops where i have oh, wow. groups of five people on zoom and we literally just talk about our goals in a like an environment where i and as we start i'm like hey don't be judgmental and the reason for being so i've set goals with my wife for the last 15 years and in the beginning i was like this feels super awkward and then yeah. to even talk to my wife about it felt awkward then she got into it and then this year i was like right i'm gonna just again head above the parapet this feels super awkward who wants to talk about goals and then all of a sudden i had a bunch of people who were like I would love to, but I have no one to talk to about it. Ah, okay. So that's been one thing. I haven't done much with the money chapter yet because I was mm -hmm. trying to go through, like on social media, go through each chapter as we go. Right. Money will be another one. I've had a bunch of people reach out like, oh, but I really want to buy a house and I just don't understand about interest rates. And again, no one talks about money. It seems to be a badge of honor if you don't have money. Like if you're someone who's like, oh, I'm actually doing quite well because I do X, Y, Z. There seems to be this this very strange kind of thing where you think, oh, that's a dirty thing. And and the problem is, I think some of the books said it. Most people who you see who have money who flaunt it are just bad examples, and yeah. so that's why you don't want to be associated with it. The same right. as politicians. Like if you were like, I want to be a politician, you'd be like, so you can be like Donald Trump? Hell no! Like why on yeah, earth would you be that? Exactly. So it's it's always about the examples of the 
the people mm-hmm. who we look up to or have in our full view. Yeah, I think a lot of people will find it very helpful. It's um, It just goes through sort of the basics of things to think about. I mean, there's so much in there that there's so much that people are going to get out of this. So thank you for writing it. It's amazing. Thank really, you. really impressive. Yeah, on, and on that piece again, like it was aimed for teenagers because I don't know how it is now, but no one at school is ever like, oh, this is how it all works. Like, yes, yeah. you do economics, <laughs> but I don't think any of it's ever designed with like, okay, this is how you might want to think about it. Because if I think back now, yeah. if someone had kind of told me all this stuff when I was younger I would probably try to buy a house when I was at college for example yeah it's funny a friend of mine in the US last night he's got a master's degree and mm-hmm. he sent me his resume and he's like oh what do you think about this and I'm like my god like so basically he's got a job he wants to get another job he's got a master's he's got a bachelor's degree he's got seven years experience at a big company and I'm thinking like man this guy's got a master's degree and he can't get another job mm-hmm it just feels like a lot of what we've been taught at school is designed to build workers who can pass tests and yeah. get work out the door. And if you step away from that and think like, okay, well, I would like to create something very different. Mm. There is just, a, the nice thing is when you do that, there is a lot of people like, great, good for you, continue yeah. to do that. But the, the for the majority of people, it feels like when you go through the schooling system, it's designed to churn people out who can be good employees. And the the problem is I look around, like there is certain people as I say, I tried to do computer science yeah. in the beginning. And I was like, there is no way on earth this is something that works for me. And then there's a lot of other people who probably get to the age of 16 and they're like, you know what? I just don't think education is built for me. Yeah, doesn't mean you're stupid. doesn't mean you're no. dumb. It just means probably you have to learn in a completely different way. And that's totally fine. But the problem is the generally accepted thinking is that, well, you didn't do a degree. So, you know, and in the US, yeah. it's such a barrier now that if you don't have a degree, You can't get a visa to work in the US. You can't get a job at a big company. Whereas in Europe, thankfully, it's built slightly differently. So my wife doesn't have a degree. She has a diploma. So where you work and do an internship at the same time for three years. And I think that's a a lot more healthy way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I think the book is really helpful for people of all ages, not just teenagers, um, as we were saying, um, because it is never too late to change what you want to do. Yeah. I suppose to that point, I'm 41 So I started writing a book at the age of 40. You know, that's the thing. You just, you never know where it will take you. And it might be a success, it might not. But if you don't try, you kind of won't find out. So Exactly. And going back to goals, if you have something to aim at, the Mm -hmm. closer you aim, the closer you're going to get to it. So if you don't aim at all, you know. Yeah, exactly. And it's funny, I've already started thinking about that for next year because I want to do another book next year. Like this was my year to kind of prove to myself that I can work outside of a big company and work in a consulting role because I was very worried like you know it's funny like when the paycheck from Nike stops and then you don't have meetings yeah after doing that for 10 years like those first few mornings I was waking up like well I think this is it like no one's ever gonna hire me again now and (laughs) but it's 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 one of those imposter syndrome coming back it's 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 just weird you know you kind of you question yourself but so this is the year where I was like okay I'm gonna make sure that I can earn money in a consulting capacity Mm -hmm. and then next year I want to write another book and I would love to make a film as well. Oh, wicked. So with all the season work and working abroad and all the things you've achieved over the years, Mm -hmm. is there anything that stands out as the biggest challenge? The biggest challenge is being comfortable, not going with the flow of people doing seasons, if that makes sense. Right. So it's very easy when you do a season to just end up where the lowest common denominator is. And I think back through uni, it was the same as this and through seasons like if you want to go and do a season and snowboard when the sun's out and smoke a ton of weed and play Xbox and watch Netflix and do not much else, mm-hmm. you can do that. And I've seen hundreds of people do that. Same at college. Like I yeah. had tons of friends who dropped out because of doing that exact same thing. It's super easy to do that and also fall into that habit. To say to yourself, okay, it's a bad weather today. day today. I'm going to go and record a podcast. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go and learn avalanche safety. I'm going to write a book. I'm going to learn to play the guitar. Like the funny thing when you do a season, I remember back then you you would love to not have to work. So I can just focus on snowboarding. But the reality is even on your best day, you probably snowboard for five to six hours. Mm -hmm. Now I snowboard for about two hours and I'm knackered, but (laughs) five to six hours. So you're like, cool, you still have 18 hours. You need sleep for eight of those. So you've still got 10 hours. Yeah. What are you going to do with that time? Mm -hmm. Because and you can tell that I feel like I have a few black holes of my memory. <laughs> but it's just kind of like 
being comfortable saying like, okay, cool. Now I'm not just going to sit here and watch Netflix all the time. I'm going to try and do something else. And yeah. I was lucky because when I was working for White Lines doing seasons, I had that thing in my brain already like, oh, well, I can't just sit around and watch DVDs all day as it was at the time. I'm going to write today. And it just takes a little bit of mm. energy and forethinking so you don't yeah. slip into that. Any advice for parents who are thinking of a move abroad or teaching their kids to snowboard, something like that? Um, yeah, well, first of all, teaching kids to snowboard is probably one of the most fulfilling feelings you can have if you love snowboarding. And I would imagine it's the same for if you play the guitar or whatever else. We had a couple of days recently where I had a powder day in the morning or I rode in Zell with some friends when it was fresh snow came back took my son up uh Horberg, and probably the time my son up on Horberg was probably better like it's so fun wow. how um, old is your son he's five and wow. he's just learned to do both turns connected so he can kind of get down and my advice would be try and get yourself somewhere where you can go repeatedly for short time frames so like mm -hmm. some days we go up the mountain and we go up for an hour or an hour and a half or two hours Obviously, with all of the mountain huts being closed, it's a little bit of a different story because yeah. you can't go in and have hot chocolate and warm up, etc. But it was the same. We were here two years ago as well. And some days, some days he doesn't even want to go up. Some days he wants to go up for two hours. On Sunday, we went up from 10 till 3 and he rode for five hours. Um, but just be totally fine with that. Yeah. I, I think that the thought of I'm going to teach little Johnny to snowboard and we're going to go somewhere for a week and he's going to ride from 8 till 4 every day is... Just out of the question yeah, and just something the kids can't do. No. Um, keep snacks with you. Oh, and also as well, if you're going to teach kids to snowboard, there's a, a bag I bought. I post about it all the time on Instagram. Right. It's called MDX1 and it's a little backpack they wear with essentially like a dog leash in the back. Yeah. <laughs> and so you can kind of help them do their turns and stuff so you know that they're never going to catch an edge uh, and it will save your back. When I started teaching my son, we came here two years ago and I was just like holding his arms the whole time and after like Day yeah. two or three, my back locked up Crouching and I was, over. Yeah, and I was kind of out, <laughs> out for the next week. So You've got quite a few videos actually on Instagram, haven't mm -hmm. you, of you teaching your son to snowboard? Yes. Very cool. So yeah, uh, people there. can check that out. What's your handle on? It's um, Jonathan underscore Weaver. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the book is at the Anti Blueprint Project. Okay. And where can people buy the book? On the website. So it's just um, the Anti Blueprint Project dot com or we actually just put it on Instagram as well. So you can just buy it. So you can click through to buy okay. it straight on the Instagram channel. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. One more thing I wanted to ask you, actually. You've got mm -hmm. a lot of quotes in the book. Yeah. A lot of quotes in the mm -hmm. book. Is there a particular quote that you live by? Yeah. But I don't... Life quotes. No, no. But ironically, <laughs> I don't even know if it's in the book. Oh, um, right. Yeah. I I don't know. But it's something my mum used to say all the time. And she would, she would just say, it is what it is. Like, it's interesting... Obviously, we all have two parents at some part and they f form different elements to our life. Some we never meet, etc. I was lucky to have both. My yeah. dad is someone who is very driven, very successful, would worry a lot. Mm -hmm. My mum, very successful, very creative, didn't worry a thing. And I suppose I try and take a lot from both of them. Yeah. But I always try and take that from my mum. You know, like sometimes it really sucks. Like you might need like new tires for your car yeah. like we just had to do our car in the u.s needed all that doing bill came in and it was like we had brakes it's like two grand and it's easy to get super annoyed about the whole thing You're like yeah. ah and my mum was just like, it is what it is like if you want to have a car there are costs to it if you want to have a child there are costs to it and there is no amount of scrimping and saving and doing this and da 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 like if you want to have kids you have to realize like okay if you're going to go on holiday you may have to rent a car buy a car seat do this da, yeah. da, da, buy diapers it sucks it's expensive that's kind of the cost of doing business and just don't give it a second thought like it's easy to get weighed down by like being stressed or worried about every single thing yeah yeah she would always just say it is what it is don't worry about it yeah what's next for you and your family then john as i say with the book, the project there is selling through the rest of the copies, mm -hmm. um, which I think we'll probably do in the next couple of months. Mm -hmm. And then as we get into like November, December, I want to start planning the next one. Also, personally, I'm consulting yeah, for three brands. So just making sure that that works, which mm -hmm. would be good. My wife's got her own business called Oilella Kids, which is an online um, kids brand. So she sells Korean kids clothes. Oh, wow. 
yeah, so that's been another thing. So she only started that a year ago, and it's been amazing to see the progress that she's made there. And a lot like you, she'd never built a website. She'd never done all these things. And now it's crazy. She has orders like every single day from all around the world. Wow. Um, that's so so cool. helping her with that. And then, yeah, hopefully the schools will open and the kids can get back to school because mm-hmm. that's definitely a, slows most things down when school's closed. Yes, I can understand that. Obviously, your book is very inspiring, The Anti-Blueprint mm-hmm. Project. Do you have any other inspiring books that you would advise people to read? Um, Yeah, one book I would say, especially for someone who is doing a project like you're doing, um, and also just in general, is a book called Get Together by People & Co. So Bailey Richardson and a couple of her business partners wrote it. And so she was in The Social Dilemma, the film on Netflix. Yeah. She's in my book. I got to meet her very happen chance. She's amazing. And it's about building communities. And it just makes you think about both professionally, if you're trying to build a community, but also also personally as well. So, you know, she talks a lot about building community. And if you don't see the community that you want, that you have to be comfortable being the person to put your hand up and say, I'm going to be the first person to create this community. So yeah. the same way you're doing with the podcast, right? You must have seen that there is a niche there and you want other people to talk about it and be yeah. part of it. So mm-hmm. you're the person who's like... I'm going to put my hand up and make this community. So that's a great book. I would say that. On the money stuff, the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad is just a really, really good one. Very great introduction to all things money. If you enjoy marketing, any of the books by Seth Godin, especially unimaginatively titled, This Is Marketing. It's a very (laughs) good book and it just dissects like a lot of campaigns. Very simple. Perfect. Those three books. One question I ask everyone is, mm-hmm. do you have anyone you'd like to nominate to come on and have a chat with me? Yes, I would nominate uh, Henry Jackson, mm-hmm. who I've spoken about. Yes. I would nominate Sarah Muir, who has done seasons in Morzine, and she's starting a brand called Palm and Pine, which is um, natural, organic, vegan sunscreen. Right, okay. Those two, and... Well, so has anyone nominated Tom West? I feel like he needs to be on this. He hasn't point. been nominated. Okay. Well, no. I think he should be on this. I agree. <laughs> yeah, I think he should be on this because all the points I've said about planning, etc. I would say he he's kind of like the person on my on my shoulder who's like enjoy today for today. Yeah. So I would say those three people. Awesome. Mm. Well, thank you very much for coming in to have a chat with me today, John. It's been absolutely lovely. My pleasure. Uh, to Thank actually you. meet you finally. And uh, I could probably talk to you for hours and hours and hours, but I know you've got to go. So we're going to wrap it up. Yeah. But yeah, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having me and good luck with the rest of the podcast. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Such a fantastic chat with the wonderful John Weaver. Thanks again for coming on the show, John. So lucky to catch him before he heads off to his next adventure in Portugal. Don't forget to check out the show notes for a link to John's book, The Anti-Blueprint Project, and any other links relating to today's show. You can now click to subscribe on any podcast platform to get new releases of this show as they come out. So please click and subscribe. A massive thank you to our sponsors, Mike Sports Bar in Meyerhofen, Wandering Woods Coffee in the UK, And of course, thank you to Mondo Wave for the music. Thanks for tuning in, guys, and I look forward to seeing you all again next time.